Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech, the College Football Hall of Fame, the Ring of Honor, Graham Harrell, and a hill Chris Level is willing to die on. Also, Joey McGuire stoking the recruiting flame in West Texas this weekend. Next on Locked On Texas Tech. You are Locked On Texas Tech, your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're going to start this thing off right. Great to be with you again on Locked On at Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network. Always appreciate being your first listen anywhere you get podcasts or on YouTube every day. He's the only Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan. Great to be back with you and kicking off today's episode, Chris, with something we didn't have on the docket necessarily a week ago. There are some things we'll get to today that we've been anticipating uh, coming up here just around the corner. But anytime we have the opportunity to mention the name Graham Harrell and therein relive some of those memories associated with number six, I'm always happy to do it. We're talking Hall of Fame. We're talking Graham Harrell. And uh, not the first time that now he's appeared on this ballot once again, is it, Chris? Yeah, you know, th- this is a. Uh... I, I feel pretty passionate about this uh, subject, and and, and it there, there's a couple of different conversations to to have. You know, I I have uh, wondered aloud. Uh, you know, when when you and I were were doing radio shows and things like that, you know, you, you'd have the, the the various conversations about you know things like this and historical perspective, and 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 some of which we weren't around for. Okay, you know, we're 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 getting older, but we're not we're not. Uh, I, I didn't watch Donnie Anderson play and, you know, and Gabe Rivera and, and all those guys, but I, uh, you know, when they started coming out with the, like the, the, the ring of honor, uh, at, at Texas tech and, and Donnie Anderson is in there and Gabe Rivera and, and obviously Zach Thomas and now Pat Mahomes. And, um, you, you've got what five or six guys in there, I think off the top of my head. And that is, that is the best of the best. Uh, for Texas Tech. And I think one of the criteria, I, I guess, for the College Football Hall of Fame is that you had to be first team All-American. And th- there's some other criteria. But so that eliminates a lot of your possible Ring of Honor candidates. But I think that has since changed. I just, I, I feel very passionate that this stuff is about storytelling. And you cannot tell the story of college football or Texas Tech football without Graham Harrell being a prominent part of that, period. I don't care what, how you want to move the goalpost and what you want to say or how you want to alter the conversation. You cannot tell the story without prominently mentioning and honoring a guy like Graham Harrell. There is no Michael Crabtree without Graham Harrell. There's a plenty of good receivers that have come through college football and and a QB couldn't get him the ball, especially this accurate, you know, like, I mean, we, we realize that Graham Harrell is top five in NCAA history in passing yards and touchdown passes. And yet he's not even honored in, in his own, his own school. Um, you know, and, and maybe maybe it has to go backwards. Maybe you have to get the Hall of Fame and then you get get into the Texas Tech deal. But I just have never understood why, why the lack of credit. Um, it, it, it is amazing to me. I mean, he is hands down the best quarterback that has ever played at Texas Tech University, period. Uh, I don't think anybody mm-hmm. – you, you, you can argue it. You can dispute it. That is my stance, and I will and, – and, and I would say – I, I would say, Harry, I'm, I'm fired up. Sorry. I'm feeling good. Yeah, you, you're making me feel you on this. Yeah, you're yeah. coming across. Yeah, I, I think, uh, and, and I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you that what what the the trump card that he has over over most everybody else is that this is one of the most accurate passers that ever played the game at that level, and especially at, at Texas Tech. I mean, you you look at like completion percentages and and things like that. I mean, his career completion percentage is in the seventies. Pat Mahomes, the best season he ever had was at sixty five. Pat, and, and this isn't a this isn't a knock on Mahomes. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Pat 
Pat's uh, legend and his ring of honor is, is, is as much about what he's done as a chief as anything. Uh, because the college careers really aren't aren't that close uh, when it comes to Harold versus oh, yeah. uh, Mahomes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and we and we understand that the the winning the the statistical. I mean, Graham Harrell's touchdown interception ratio for his college career was basically four to one. Mahomes's was three to one. Um, you know, I just you you look at a, a couple of seasons where there's around you know uh, five thousand yards plus, and you're over forty touchdowns plus. And I, I just think it. Look at the games that you won, and so I and it and it, it it irritates me that he doesn't get more credit nationally either uh, in some of these conversations. That Crabtree was the the one that kind of carried, and, and maybe that's what hurts Graham. I don't know, uh, but I just think that Graham Harrell deserves a ton of credit for really kind of changing the game at that at that level. And Mike was right there with him, so don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying there. This is a we could have a, a group conversation, but I just uh, G- Graham was phenomenal. And anytime anybody comes up, best quarterback in Texas Tech history, that's an easy answer for me. It really is. I, I would not, I would not even hesitate. And again, you've had a variety. I love BJ. I love Cumby and Hodges. And Cliff was really good. I think Seth Daigie is a very underrated guy. You've got Mahomes, who's the Super Bowl MVP that played for you. But I'm taking Harold ten out of ten times. Interesting. I, I did not expect you to make uh, as strong of a stance on that particular front as far as all-time Texas Tech quarterback lore, but I do agree with you entirely whenever it comes to uh, the story of Graham Harrell being celebrated. I, I do think there's something about, just like with their Heisman candidacy back in 2008, about splitting the vote. I, yeah. I don't think there's really one without the other. It was a perfect matchup. The synergy was off the hook, to use an industry term, between uh, Michael Crabtree and Graham Harrell. Crabtree was, however, in one way, particularly individually uh, outstanding because there was no two-time Bolitnikoff Award winner that existed uh, within the human species uh, prior to Michael Crabtree uh, existing, as far as I understand it. So I, I feel like, Chris, I was, well, first off, very glad to uh, see them, I guess, somewhat. I don't know if this is just like, something that didn't exist and fans just talked about it, thought it did or not, but to see them, I guess, adjust, adjust or evolve um, when it comes to the Texas tech ring of honor and some of the criteria, I guess that was required there. You don't want to dilute that pool. Obviously you want to keep it a very special one, but uh, whether it was, um, you know, college football hall of fame or first team all American or whatever, some of these requirements were uh, I'm glad that maybe there's some some fudging on some of those things as far as locally telling your story, because I agree wholeheartedly when it comes to the case of uh, just about every uh, Hall of Fame. The, the story is what's there to be told and cherished and memorialized, just like you said a little bit earlier. And you can't exclude uh, some of these characters from the story and tell the story in the right way. And I double down on that, triple down on that. Uh, from a local perspective I I don't know why you wouldn't be you know (laughs) jumping through hoops uh, to celebrate guys that your fans want to celebrate year after year after year and for the most part they have done that and I guess I would say I haven't really had an issue yet uh, with the ordering or anything like that and I don't know like I would ever have an issue I'm not going to pick it or anything or protest if they put up somebody that I disagree with but I think for the most part the order has been justified as far as Texas Tech's ring of honor um, I think it did get a little more interesting whenever we started talking about Patrick Mahomes uh, a season ago because of what you just beautifully described there, the tech impact versus the professional impact. But I get striking while the iron is hot, but it does kind of seem like maybe we're coming around the time uh, where number six is due, right? I, I think maybe we're approaching that. Or do you feel like that there have been one or multiple names we've heard so far where you were thinking, ah, I don't know why we're not going with Harold. Should we have had a pairing with Crabtree or – Maybe something along those lines. Yeah, you know, and I, I've uh, I don't know why he's uh, re- really in both of these conversations, whether it's College Football Hall of Fame or or, or Texas Tech's Rings of, Ring of Honor. I, I think Byron Hanspart is always a, a name that you, you you simply cannot tell the story uh, without you know of of the program without prominently mentioning his name. I mean, he was. Uh, and and that was you know in in the in the mid '90s when you you were predominantly running team obviously and everybody knew who was getting the ball and yet they had no answer. I mean he was uh, and and maybe I'm a bit 
bias there because I was like right there at the, you know, there, there was two guys on those teams, those 95, 96 kind of uh, range teams. Marcus Coleman on the defensive side, who I thought was kind of a way before his time, and he was a draft pick by the Jets. And I think Hansbar was a draft pick by the Falcons. Uh, but but those were two of the best football players that to this day I still have ever seen because Marcus Coleman could play whatever position you wanted, and he kind of did uh, back before that became a thing. Now it's, you know, there's positionless and hybrids and all these different things, and he was doing that way before. But Hans Bard, I mean, yeah, you, you can go look at the numbers uh, and, and go look at what he averaged in the, in the, in the yards per carry and – uh, the the I mean the 1500 or about a 1300 yard season and a 2000 yard season I think uh, for, for for Byron and he he and, and I, I think with him there's some sort of I, I think this is bogus it makes me laugh if anybody were to use this against him I I, I shame on you but it's like the 0. 0.0 GPA or whatever it is last semester here. Like he apparently was at preaching at schools and speaking engagements and all that his last semester here. Then he went, uh, he he declared for the draft like after the bowl game when they played Iowa. Uh, and I and I'm like that has with, with what goes on now and and with what probably oh went on God. way back when that that's yes yeah, save that our argument uh, in any case because yeah anyway he he was uh, he was a phenomenal player and. You know, I just think that this is supposed to be about storytelling and, and telling, yeah. you know, the, the, the story of your program and, 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 and the way you want to tell it. And I think uh, I would say Hans Bart and Harold in some order would be the next two guys I would heavily consider. And then we're talking Ring of Honor, but these guys are, are Hall of Fame worthy and, and, and all that in every sense, every sense of the word, uh, in my opinion. That's right. Uh, former North Texas offensive coordinator, Texas Tech quarterback, <laughs> Graham Harrell. I hope they list that in the correct order. Let's go with Texas Tech QB first. And I think personally, uh, here in West Texas, Ring of Honor wise, we're beginning uh, to get a little close to overdue on one Western Welker. I I'd like to see that name mentioned at some point in the near future. And I think that's the guy that maybe some of the fudging on those rigid requirements will serve best eventually because I'm not sure he was on all of those lists as far as college accolades at the time uh, that he should have been, but that's going to be an easy addition at some point in time yeah, uh, and, as well. And Cowan, and, and, and with him, as impressive as his college career was, it, it's it, – it, that, that one is and, – and I love Wes, and he did. He kind of – he was extremely productive – but that's going to be – like him as a candidate, if we're being honest, that's as much about what he did at the professional level as what he did in, in college. He did not have – you know, historically, compared to Hanspart or Harrell, he doesn't like, you know, show up on all the record lists and all these kinds of things, I think, compared to the other two. But I think you, you make a great point. Wes Walker is definitely deserving. But, again, with his candidacy, it'll be about – what he did at the next level as much as what he did in college, you know, in the iconic punt return. And uh, I guess well, that's the thing I really think of him as more as a specialist. I mean, NCAA all-time punt return leader at one time, right? Uh, yeah. And I, I, I was going to say, I think he, yeah, that, that record has since been tied. I think he had seven touchdowns, uh, seven punt returns so. for touchdowns at one point. Somebody has, I think since tied it, but yeah, it, it, what one point he did. Uh, so I think that that's there really is as far as like those first originators of that leech era that I think about like Wes Welker is one of those oh, yeah. uh, and again locally if you're telling that story uh, I think that guy's got to get a shout at some point in time but we'll wait with bated breath and see speaking of the story of your program presently you're cooking with gas and there's a weekend on tap here in West Texas coming up we want to turn your attention towards because there are some big things popping as far as visitors in town, we'll even discuss stars among that Texas Tech possible galaxy coming up next on Locked On Texas Tech. But first, today's episode brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book and the official sports book of Locked On. Head over right now to the App Store, download the FanDuel app, or head to fanduel.com slash locked on and find out why it's America's number one sports book. The app is safe and secure easy to use and you're always getting paid instantly with FanDuel and if you've never done it before now's the perfect time to get started because new customers are getting in on that no sweat 
first bet. Now up to $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. That's right, $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet don't bank. That's with the no sweat first bet. So get on over to FanDuel.com slash locked on or download the FanDuel app. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on and get set up with the no sweat first bet and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Glad to have you along for the ride on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network with Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan. We just spent some time strolling down memory lane a moment ago, but fast forwarding now to the present, which is a pretty exciting time as well for Joey McGuire and the Red Raiders. And Chris, I'm, I'm kind of slow to come to some of this because in part, I come by it honestly, I've been burned, really dialing in (laughs) to the recruiting scene before. But there is some evidence now, skins on the wall. Some time has passed since Coach McGuire got on campus. And as we've touched on before, you you cannot ignore the attention that he's garnering and his staff is garnering as far as those recruiting trail efforts. And therein, I think, lies in part some of the reason why you're involved in some pretty special conversations for some pretty special players Uh, some that maybe don't come around all that often. I want to get to one specifically coming up in just a bit. But in general, just kind of setting the table for what is going on uh, over at the football training facility this weekend and in the context of of some of uh, what Texas Tech will be hosting here in a couple of days. Yeah, so, you you know, this is still very new to me, even though it's not really new. This is, uh, I think you're you're going on – uh, I don't know. This is about year six, maybe, uh, with with kind of the early signing period, and and so with that, you you have official visits going on in in the summer, and I, I'm I'm still of the mindset that like June is kind of when everybody takes a deep breath, and you you have these these camps going on over there, and 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 maybe there's some some light working out and everything like that, but it's it's business as usual, and even though the town and the campus are fairly empty because everybody's kind of on vacation or just kind of not, not on campus football program is, is both feet in right now. They, they are, they hosted, I think three to five visits last weekend may get a commitment, uh, you know, this week from one of those visitors last weekend. And there's, uh, I think uh, in the 15 prospect range uh, this coming weekend. Uh, And so, and it's, and then the weekend after that is is another big weekend. But you're you're, you're looking at uh, trying to get your recruiting class put to bed here the next couple of weeks. And and I say that in that they can't sign until you know mid December. But this is when it it goes on because as August gets closer, then it becomes a dead period, and then everybody's season starts, yours included. And then you look up and it's time to, to sign your letter of intent. And maybe you have time to sneak out to some games and, and visits, but there'll be a lot of this coming weekend, Cal, and we've got all the names on, on redraidersports.com and all that, so I'm not going to bore anybody with like all the all the minutiae <laughs> here. But you've got your quarterback that's committed coming in this weekend. Those are – and we were talking about Harold, or Harold earlier in the show. That's who Will Hammond, who's coming in this weekend, really reminds me of, honestly. He's a bit bigger – then Graham, extremely accurate. He was an Elite 11 uh, quarterback finalist as far as that competition goes where they put these quarterbacks through the through the gauntlet and and really try to spit out 11 of the best ones in the country from a prospect standpoint. And then you've got a ton of, of current commitments like Trey Jackson, the tight end, you know, Holton Hendricks, an offensive lineman. So there's a, ter- a bunch of current commitments that are, uh, are, are that have already committed that will be here this weekend as well. But – you take them out to eat. You you really you you measure them. You take them bowling. You you let them eat barbecue and steak. You, I mean, all, all the above, and you just try to you know, and then let Joey be Joey, and then uh, you, usually that's worked out pretty well. <laughs> Check their ankles, which was <laughs> advice from my grandfather once upon a time. Uh, for any prospects I might have been looking for, again, once upon a time. 
no longer. Just wanted to reiterate that uh, on the program here today. I don't know who's out there necessarily in the Locked on Texas Tech audience. I just am really excited, Chris, to see some sustained success as far as recruiting trail success. Because they're like these early returns. You get this splash, you know, and, and Coach McGuire is really exciting. And it's a honeymoon, I guess, in a lot of ways. And you think, all right, do you get a pop? Uh, as far as maybe some commitments from student athletes, um, which you did, but then you sustain that. And I'm so excited about the the future now because you've had some on field success. I hope you're able to follow it up with at least the same amount or even more, but you've had some on field success now proof of performance that really meant quite a bit. And you did it against, in some cases, uh, some that you're, you're recruiting against heavily for individual prospects here or there. And it's not very often uh, that we're talking about five stars beside a name, Chris, that seems like is gaining some momentum in favor of the good guys. It's Micah Hudson, and I'm not here to tell anybody to launch off into the land of five-star bliss just yet, but I've been following this cautiously optimistic, Chris, and I'm just wondering here with the latest um, to discuss today, what's the picture kind of looking like between uh, Hudson, Texas Tech, and what seems to be the other primary suitor, the University of Texas. Yeah, and I think I think he's set to come in the following weekend. Uh, but I, I, you know, th- there was a time when I would have told you that that Micah was a, a prospect that would maybe wait until December to ultimately decide. Maybe he might tell whatever school what he was going to do, and then have a you know, a ceremony maybe in, in December, kind of let, let the anticipation build or whatever. And, and I, now I would tell you that I think this is something that could get, could get done uh, sooner than later. I think uh, my, that, that sentiment has been echoed by people that uh, are, are very close mm-hmm. to the situation as well. And I, I think by all accounts, uh, Texas tech is the leader here. Um, and so it doesn't mean that you have signed this prospect. It doesn't mean this prospect is guaranteed to, to come here or whatever. I'm just saying there, there's ebbs and flows to this, but I think that Texas Tech has done a phenomenal job of trying to build a relationship with with Micah and, and those that surround him. I think even uh, so much as I think his girlfriend is, is uh, set to come to Texas Tech at, at last uh, word that I got. So that would certainly uh, seem to help. But th- this is just a sign, the fact that you're in these conversations and that you feel like, like there's a realistic shot. Because way back in the day, th- there'll have to be folks that were on, on RedRiverSports.com way a long time ago when there was the name of like Gerald Jones, I think was his name. He was a prospect out of Oklahoma. <laughs> he went to the same school as I think Tremaine Swindoll, just to give you a, a flashback. And, and Gerald Jones was this four-star big time, you know, like athlete and skill player. And Texas Tech had put their recruiting class to bed and you're waiting on one last announcement to see what Gerald Jones is going to do. And it it was going to be either, I think, Texas Tech or Tennessee. And I can't remember exactly why Oklahoma and Oklahoma State really weren't in the picture. That's not the point. The point was, is that you had rarely gotten into these conversations and, you know, to your point earlier about being burned, they have the ceremony. He pulls <laughs> off the shirt and it's Tennessee orange and whatever. And and, and, it, and it frustrated everybody. But the year before, it's like you weren't really – there was nothing to be frustrated about because you weren't in on any of those guys. And yeah. I think that, yeah. you know, you, you, you seemingly are starting to get back to some of this. Um, and, and Joey's kind of kicking the door in. With, with some of the recruiting stuff. And, 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 I, and I'll tell you this, as much as it's fun to pay attention to the high profile prospect, I would caution folks that you really should be paying attention to the, the ones that are, are light, lightly recruited too, because th- their, their staff vets these guys. Extre- I mean, it's extremely thorough. I mean, we're talking track and field. We're talking football. We're talking camp stuff. We're talking game tape. It's as thorough as anything I've ever seen or heard about. And and I think that it's fascinating to me when they kind of uncover one. And then all of a sudden, it's like Texas Tech offered this kid. And next thing you know, 
Here comes right. the here. They're they're doing work for a lot of colleges out there. Period. Uh, they're doing evaluations for a lot of colleges out there, and I think they've built uh, a <laughs> reputation. And so people are like, okay, well, tech offered. It must be fast, or it must be good, or whatever. So that part is fascinating to me too. I, I love those guys too, and, and it's fun when you win them. You keep them in house. I think instantly of uh, like LaRaven Clark. I think was an example of that. You saw a lot of big boys show up later in the process and and want him to come to their town, but. Uh, I don't even know who was to credit for that identification early on in the process, but there's always someone out there. It seems like, uh, or s- multiple someone's that, uh, you'll find that, that maybe Texas tech will get there first. And that always means something doesn't mean everything to every guy, but, uh, you know, those initial relationships certainly mean something. Um, I, I don't know, Chris, you know, what to make of, I guess, I guess the pitch, following year two, if things don't go quite as well. And I don't want to go down that road just yet, but I think we've seen already what Coach McGuire and uh, his staff can do on the recruiting trail just by sheer will and effort uh, prior to last season occurring. But again, really expecting uh, some 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 dividends here on the other side of a season that uh, I think really meant a lot again to your fan base and hopefully gave you some things uh, to point to out there on the recruiting trail. And, and maybe you have some big-time success. So we'll be keeping a close eye on that and stick with us here on Locked On Texas Tech for anything evolving sooner or later uh, on those fronts. Before we are out of here today, we're back for one more round to tip the cap to Tim Tadlock and the boys, which unfortunately, <clears throat> in kind of a character-building way, for me at least, means tipping the cap to the other guys. Yeesh. Next on Locked On Texas Tech. Great to be with you again on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network. And with Chris Level, I'm Casey Cowan, marking the time today because the season has come to an end. Baseball is over which uh, for the most part, we, we got to be near the end of this calendar, right, Chris? Are we, are we at the end of the athletics calendar just yet? Who's still out there swinging something or hitting something <laughs> or kicking or throwing <laughs> somewhere on campus? I, I think as far as Texas Tech goes, I do. I, well, you know what? I think uh, track and field uh, national championships are still – that may be this coming weekend um, in yeah. Austin, I think. <laughs> that may be the last thing. I think Wes Kitley's taking like – Oh, it seemed like uh, eleven men, nine women, or some 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 combination like that to to the national meet. But I think that's that would be it. As uh, Tim Tadlock's guys bow out yesterday, and I mean, it, I I don't know what what is more shocking that you hadn't been shut out at all this year until yesterday, or that Florida was able to shut you out. Uh, I don't I don't I was just that that's wild to me. Uh, that speaks to how good the offense has been and just consistent. I mean, averaged, I think, a little over eight runs a game. Uh, and maybe, maybe I don't know if that was conference or home games or just in general, but I uh, heard that yesterday. And uh, But just Florida just – you know, and, and I think the frustrating thing for the fan, and that's not really how this sport works, but you, you felt like I saw a lot of, man, no fight or no, you, you know, just kind of – rolled over or there wasn't much, pa- you know, what I, I think though, that the baseball, it's about pitching. They pitched better than you did. And you kept waiting for the bats to wake up and you, you, you could get a few hits uh, going in an inning. And then you'd, you'd hit into a double play or you, you'd strike out twice and then ground out. And there, there was nothing to show for it. I think, what was it like runners in scoring position? I think of the whole regional, you were like something like four for 26 or four for 27, something mm-hmm. along those lines. Mm-hmm. And that kind of sums it up. Uh, but yeah, for you to, you know, basically get out scored, what was that? Uh, what would that have been 11 to one in those, those final two games versus Florida? Not something I would have expected, but Florida's guys stepped up, man. And sometimes that's about being at home and, and just pitching well and being comfortable, but boy, they, yeah, they, uh, they they looked like the better team, period. Um, and I think that, yeah. that first yeah that first game that you got against them was a really well played game. But uh, they beat you two out of three, fair and square. And uh, now you head into the off season with a really young team, and a lot of which uh, should come back next year. 
I'm disgusted to do it, but uh, I got to really give a lot of credit to to Florida. I, I really hate to do it, but uh, yeah, I thought they were the better team, and then some. Shockingly, like some of the pitching that you got as a team over the weekend, I was a little surprised by pleasantly yeah. and disappointed and surprised that there wasn't more offense there uh, to back some of that up. But even when you put the ball in play, Chris, there were some. I mean, some great plays made by Florida. The play down the third baseline on Sunday, I think, when you had a man on first, probably would have been first and third with no outs, was incredible. I think like the second, was it the second batter of the game? Maybe yesterday, uh, there's a shot up the middle and the second baseman makes a great play on it. I mean, they make it kind of look routine. I'm not acting like they're the greatest web gems you've ever seen, but really good play, certainly on the college level. And you can see why Florida... Uh, is thought of as they are uh, really good pitching, really good hitting and, and played some really good and consistent defense. So credit to the Gators. I thought they were uh, just a better team than Texas Tech. And that eventually showed as far as the fight or anything like that, I, I picked up none of those vibes, none of them. Uh, I just thought Florida beat them fair and square. There were some self-inflicted wounds, obviously, from Texas Tech that you hate to see that began to pile up, especially into yesterday. But uh, I thought you saw some culture that you could lean on to even take it to Monday, do what you did on Saturday. You come out, take care of business like you should have on Friday. But I don't think it was necessarily, aside from the final result, a disappointing effort by any means uh, for Tim Tadlock and the Red Raiders. But I know they didn't reach the standard that they want to reach for this program. So obviously it'll be kind of a back to the drawing board uh, sort of off season. Here's my radical drawing board. You want it before I wrap this up, Chris? I've got a radical, radical drawing board right behind me. I've been working on. Bring it. Uh, this is just since just since they lost yesterday. We're going to totally redesign uh, Dan Law Field. I didn't say Rip Griffin Park. I said Dan Law Field. We have got to condition ourselves in the regular season for what the postseason typically requires, and that includes that cavernous freaking ballpark in Omaha. It seems like, Chris, as we sail through so many seasons, regular seasons, that is, with offense filling our cells, whether it's eventually into a regional or a super regional, but certainly Omaha, you get into some of these ballparks elsewhere and you're like, dog, <laughs> where did the offense go? A lot of times I think that plays in to a larger degree than some uh, might assume. I don't want to make it play into a larger degree than to give credit again to Florida for what they did just as a team, but you probably know the experience I'm talking about, man. I mean, there's some of these regular seasons where you're so good and you see that home and away also within the regular mm -hmm. season, but I don't know. Should we kick the fences back a little bit? Should we take it to the other side of the road? And that just plays as a warning track. We got a blacktop <laughs> warning track out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of that has to do with, with jet stream too, you know, and, and the, just the, go, yeah. the, the wind and, and all that. But man, I, I, I get it because <laughs> it, it, that's why you're so difficult to beat here because you can out hit almost anybody over the last decade plus. Uh, be, it, and you just learn and, and, and Tadlock is famous for kind of telling people, you know, it's like, man, he's not great defensively. If he can hit, I'll find somewhere for him to go stand. Right. I mean, he just loves loading the lineup up with, with with guys that can that can mash and and. But but you're right. It, it just felt it, it. You know, Florida found the holes all, all weekend, and it just felt like you yeah. couldn't uh, you just couldn't get anything meaningful to fall in the gap or you know other than the two home runs by Gavin Cash and you you had some singles and. In, in, the, in the final two games, things like that, but just nothing that was just really that big hit that was damaging. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what else they're going to do. I, I know you're you're semi joking and semi by being serious about moving the fences semi. back, but 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 I, I I am curious. The next, uh, you know, they've spent some money on on the the facility uh, clubhouse and. It's uh, and I, and I'd have to go back and look at the dollar figure. This was in the what maybe the two to three million dollar. Maybe we're in the ten to twelve million dollar range. But anyway, they, they spent some significant money on kind of revamping the clubhouse as you drove up, like Drive of Champions, and you've got the west parking lot, and then and Den Law on, on the right hand side, and they really are, are trying to. But th there's more that needs to be done to that facility, and I think everybody knows it. I think that is. Oh yeah, they've kind of tried to do enough at a time just to kind of keep it going. 
but yeah, there, there's some upgrades that need to happen big picture. And I think though, that there's this order of things. It was like first year, years ago, it was like basketball is the only like big 12 program without a, their own practice facility. You know, they, their practice court used to be like in the arena. And so they felt like, okay, so the Womble what was something that they desperately needed. Then it was the football stadium. And we see that this has got some timetable to it and, and, and significant amount of money. But once that's completed, and again, we're still a ways away from that, right? That's a, a year from this coming fall. So we're still 15, 16 months away. Um, I, I do think that they would come back and like, okay, okay, what do we need now? You know, and I think that Dan Law would, would certainly be something that would uh, would get another project of some sort. Uh, but, you know, I, again, I don't know if it's, it involves the outfield fences or not. But uh, it's like uh, Tim Tadlock, J yeah. Bob, and Gardner and Hayward standing on top of that new clubhouse waving those old College World Series sign, like, hey, anybody remember us over here? We go to College <laughs> World Series. Remember us? You got to yeah. do like a, a drive-by car wash fundraiser. I don't know. Tim Tadlock in a bikini. Okay, maybe that's an idea for another day. We're getting into the summer, as you might can tell. So uh, spare us some uh, buffering room here uh, for the next couple of months on Locked on Texas Tech. We'd appreciate that. Uh, congratulations to them, though, on a season that I th certainly think had uh, plenty of highs. Unfortunately, not the result that you wanted to see at the end of it, but back at it next time I'm around with plenty to say, uh, I'm sure, in the Big 12 Conference and hopefully beyond as well as far as the national tournament is concerned. Chris, great insight and perspectives as always, man. I enjoyed the dog out of it. Thanks for the time, man. We'll do it again. Good stuff, man. We'll do it again tomorrow. Word Association Wednesday tomorrow, question mark? We That's shall right. see. Let's ride that train. Keep hope alive, everybody. We shall see. <laughs> He's Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan. Subscribe on YouTube, anywhere you get podcasts so you never miss an episode. Thanks for being an everydayer, and we'll see you tomorrow on Lockdown Texas Tech.